Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Bradley Martin here with Kindful, and I'm really excited to have Crystal Frazier with us today. Um, and Crystal is going to be talking about how to connect, collaborate, and close. Um, and so I'm going to hand it off to Crystal in just a moment. But before we do that, I want to give just a couple quick housekeeping notes. Number one is this session will be recorded today. So um, if you don't need to feel like you need to take feverish notes or if there's something um, that you want to share with a board member or a colleague or a friend after the fact, we'll send the recording out. Um, you can expect to get that a little later today. Um, in addition, we definitely want you to ask as many questions as you can. Um, if you look over on your GoToWebinar control panel and you'll see a questions tab throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, um, just drop them in there. And I think Crystal will have a little bit more information on, about when we're going to answer questions and things like that, but I'll be trying to go through and looking for some themes. So please don't be shy. Go ahead and drop your questions in there. But just to make sure we get the most out of the time, Crystal, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to you, let you take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Bradley. I truly appreciate it. And thank you for inviting me, uh, the Kindful and Bloomerang team. This has been fantastic. I've presented webinars before, and I always love interacting with your audience. Your audience, I do many webinars, and I can tell you your audience is just one that is unmatched. So great questions, great feedback, and they're just wanting to know more. So I'm very excited about that. So hi, everyone. Good to be here and glad you're taking the time out of your day. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, connect, collaborate, and close. And I've presented this a few times, but there are some changes I made to this presentation just for you because we are in 2021. So when the times change, we change as nonprofit professionals. That pretty much goes without saying. So there is a component called 21 nonprofits, 2021 nonprofit story that we're going to talk about, okay? Very, very important. So let's begin so we don't waste any time. All right, legal disclaimer, we can go past that. And this is our agenda for today. If you registered for this webinar, of course you did, the agenda is the same that you saw on the website. This is what I'm going to try my best to stick to. Um, but I have stories, I have little anecdotes that are gonna help you in your fundraising efforts, okay? I am all about sharing information so you take up less of your time because I know many of you are wearing more than one hat. So we're gonna talk about five main things, how to research and connect to prospects, how to develop relationships with funders, very important. How to recruit virtual volunteers using social media. I can tell you that third component was not in my presentation years ago, and you can tell because of the times I've added it. So it's very important. How to use the four Ps of prospecting to gain interest in your initiatives. And how to close using three steps for successful outcomes. Now, we will go through this presentation, which is about 45 minutes. And what I will do at the halfway point is I will ask Bradley if there are any questions or I'll take a look-see in the question bank and see if you've um, asked anything. I encourage you to ask any and every question. I have heard it all. I have seen it all. Ask your questions about your fundraising efforts about being a nonprofit professional and how to thrive after the, during the, and after the pandemic in 2021. If your efforts changed in 2020, it is imperative that you ask the questions you need answers to, okay? All right. So connect, collaborate, and close. The first puzzle of this piece we're going to discuss is connecting, connecting with your funders, your donors, and your prospects. So the first bullet point, how to research and connect to your prospects. 
this is extremely, extremely important. Some people want to delve in the other steps of connecting and collaborating, building relationships, but you really need to have a solid foundation. And that's what we're going to discuss today, the first thing. So the first thing is how, you know, why to even perform prospect research? I get this question a lot because I understand your time is taken up by so many things. And it's like, why should we take time to do this and not dive into it? Well, the first reason is you discover new donors when you do this that are giving to similar causes similar to yours. That's why it's so important to do prospect research. That could be an entirely different presentation doing prospect research, but I want to give you the basics of it so you're not spinning your wheels as a nonprofit professional. You want to review the donor history so you can create a better ask. When you're, when you're making your ask, it is your moment to shine. It is your moment to ask them if they want to buy in your organization, either as a donor, as a volunteer, or as a collaborator, or even as an ambassador. And we will talk about that as well. Because working with organizations, some donors, I have asked them to be ambassadors first before they were even a donor. Okay, so there are different methods to get them to the end goal. And we'll talk about that. Obtain cleaner data and update your donor database. It is very, very important. I have extensive experience managing donor databases, and I can tell you my goal was to always make sure that our data was clean and up to date. And you know it is a never ending process. So, this is why uh, prospect research is extremely important because people change things change and initiatives change. What they were interested in in 2019 may not be what they're interested in giving to in 2021. It may be a difference. So before we go on, I wanna tell you a little bit about my background. And I started in fundraising oh, about 12 years ago at this point. And I was taught traditional methods. I even started, I was so excited. I had my first little 5K walk when we were outside and interacting and 5K walks were all the rage to uh, raise money with a small nonprofit I was with. I was doing grant writing and I was also managing their donor database at the time. And wearing all of those hats taught me that some of the traditional methods may work for me or they may not, and it really depends on your prospect. So I wanna show you the traditional methods that I was taught early on in performing prospect research, and then what I am doing now. This is all about connection. This is preparing you for a connection with your donor or your prospect. Nonprofit involvement is the first one. This is when you find a tie between board members, if they may know someone, or foundation members. They typically already understand the importance of giving to organizations. They already have a giving history. When I used um, traditional methods of prospect research, a database, I would always look at real estate ownership because it, it's offered within the database, you can see it. And I was taught to never look under 2 million. Now, these are traditional methods that I was taught. I'm gonna tell you what I'm using today because some of these do not apply, okay? Because donors are extremely diverse now. So this is what I started with, nonprofit involvement, real estate ownership, how invested they were in the organization, employer information, who they worked for, uh, to see who had similar salaries similar to theirs, who they were um, connected with, maybe alumni, affiliate organizations or associations they belong to. I would use personal information such as their hobbies. You can see a lot of personal information using the social media channels. This can support your donor communication. One of the social media channels that I used to use years ago was Twitter because hashtags became popular and a lot of people were using 
cash tag, for instance, I'm located in Texas, and so they would use regional hashtags and they would put their cause within the hashtag. I found donors that way. I approached them as a prospect and converted them to a donor. That is the power of social media because I see they're already out and about giving to other organizations, galas, and now virtual events. I use that information to approach them. There's different ways that I approach them, but it's usually via LinkedIn, and we'll talk about that. There's so much you can do with prospect research. So my method now, okay? So this is maybe eight, nine years in, and I said, you know what, I'm gonna do what works for me and what brings me the most success as a nonprofit professional. So my method of prospect research is I look at individual giving separate, of course, from funders. So I use LinkedIn, and there is a feature on there I wanna tell you about that's specifically for nonprofit professionals. So LinkedIn or Google Alerts, I only use Google Alerts if they're not on LinkedIn. Google Alerts works where I will put in keywords to use that will pull information on tweets, on Google posts about the latest events, about uh, individual giving donors in the area that may support the cause of the nonprofit that I represent. So I use Google Alerts for that reason. You need to be careful with Google Alerts though, because if your keyword is too broad, you will receive any and everything that Google has to offer every single day. And so you really want to drill down your keywords. If your nonprofit is regional and you're looking for re new regional dollars, then of course you want to drill down, say nonprofit, um, if Houston is the city, and then what you're interested in. You can put in things like virtual galas, see who's attending, because people are starting to do virtual galas now, organizations. You can see who's attending those galas. You can put in the release of annual reports that are coming out with different organizations. You can use that information to find new prospects and donors. I use Google Alerts for all of that. So that's a great tool for you. A personal summary, okay? You want to, with your prospect, write a paragraph and make sure that you have it in your donor database about what they give to, any communication you've had with them. Because if you are not a team of one, you don't want your colleague repeating your efforts, number one, and you don't want that prospect to be approached two and three times. That's why your database, it's important that it's clean and thorough and that it includes information like this. Philanthropic history, extremely important because you want to know who they've given to in the past and how much, quite frankly, because this is how you form your ask, okay? The contact information, you wanna make sure this information is up to date. You can miss out on money, and I've seen this done before, including in my own career. You can miss out on money just by not updating contact information or asking for an update on a regular basis. Okay, so it's a very basic component of prospect research, but it's very important to your fundraising efforts. I want you to spend less time doing this. That's my goal. My prospect research for funders, of course, board affiliation is the first one. Okay, I try to see if there is some type of connection. They're giving history, annual reports of organizations that they have funded in the past. I look at that to see who's giving to that organization. Funder guidelines, you want to make sure that you're a match, that your initiatives for your organization matches the funder's priorities. What If their priorities is this, you wanna make sure that your organization offers that, or if you're um, creating a new program, you wanna make, you wanna reiterate that in your efforts. You wanna make sure that they know that this may be new to you, but that you can still do it, okay? So you wanna make sure that it is a match for that funder. I use my research to create the ask. I use it in all of my communication because I'm, I'm trying to 
cultivate a relationship with the funder and the prospect. I use it to, to cultivate, to, to communicate with them, to stay in contact with them. If we're having a virtual Zoom update of some sort, an organizational update, I make sure that I reach out to them and let them know and invite them. I want to, during the times that we're in, to stay in contact with them. Everyone cannot do something in person right now, so I want to keep in contact. Since I'm losing that component of it, I have to pivot with the times we're in and use virtual events to my advantage. So I use prospect research for all of that. Now, this is still under bullet one. We're talking about how to research and connect to prospects. So what you want to do is connect with people who are your allies allies to your industry who understand. Uh, let's see, Bradley, I'm looking at the, the question bank and it says that I'm dropping in and out. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I'm, I'm actually able to hear you just okay. fine. Okay, cool, okay. All right, very good. So after I go um, over the candidates, which we're gonna talk about, I see a few questions now and I wanna get these out of the way. Okay, so we'll talk about them. All right, so let me show you how to connect to people who may be allies in your industry. So I want you to consider this, okay, these candidates. The first one is Wendy Ryder. You wanna answer the question, who can I connect with that is passionate about my industry? The reason why that you're connecting with people like Wendy Ryder and the other ones that we're gonna talk about is you want to get your nonprofit story out there. See, when I first started in fundraising and with nonprofit orgs, I usually ran the social media. In fact, I asked to because if I'm doing the fundraising, then the donor database, and if I'm doing that component, I want to control our front-facing presence when it comes to social media, what we're saying out there, how often we're making the ask, the, the type of posts and, and questions I wanna pose to our audience so that we get those comments, those likes, those shares, and that feedback so it boosts our presence within social media. So I usually asked to if I could do the posts, if I could pretty much run the entire thing. Um, it might be a control issue with me, I don't know, but I just saw them going hand in hand, that they work uh, together well. So the first person, type of person that you wanna connect with is Wendy Ryder. Wendy lives on social media. She writes thought-provoking posts. Wendy has a moderate following and doesn't mind sharing great content. I'm going to give you an example so this can really, I can drive it home to you. I was working with a nonprofit and their initiatives was uh, climate control and also recycling. What I did, because once again, I wanted to run the social media. And so I contacted people who always had great posts, great content and information related to that industry. And I would simply just ask them to retweet, repost, re-Facebook, whatever it's called on there, re-everything, LinkedIn especially, if they could just repost our content. I cannot tell you how many new followers and new eyes we had on that particular organization, that, that it boosts their presence, that they were known more Be before they weren't doing any of that. They would put one post every few days or maybe once a week and that would be it. Now they have people donating because they simply see a post on someone who has a following like Wendy Ryder. That is the reason for, for connecting with candidates like Wendy. Another one is Sharing Sam. Of course, I made these, these uh, names up. I just think it's hilarious. But it's very, very serious about connecting with these type of people. So Sam loves sharing content that's important to him. Sam only comments or shares others' posts and does not necessarily write his own. 
He is a meme posting, gift generating type of person. Okay. Sam lives on social media, but he doesn't live for himself to write on social media. He just rather repost content that's great to him. Now, when you are connecting with others on social media and asking them to do this, remember the people you're choosing that they represent your organization. You want to stay away from people who are deemed controversial. If you have to ask yourself, is this person controversial? Don't do it. Because you, you, you simply asking yourself is doubt and then you may want to find someone else to connect to. With Wendy Ryder and Sharing Sam, you want to connect to people who represent an organization themselves, okay? That they, they actually have some skin in the game, okay? That it's, a, that it's already an industry. Yours is an industry they're familiar with and they understand. The next one is Irene Influencer. So Irene's social media influence is stuff dreams are made of. She can put your organization on the map, get you followers, more donors, everything. She's not a, we're not talking about superstars, okay? We're not talking about celebrities. We're talking about people who are an influencer in your particular industry. That's what we're talking about. I, I wanna, don't wanna make the mistake that you thinking, I'm saying, you know, don't collect, uh, connect to celebrities. That is definitely not what I'm saying. I'm saying connect to people who are an influence, who understand your industry well. Freddie the fan. So Freddie represents your supporters. This is the person on social media when you connect with him. If you post something, he already likes it. He's already sharing it, okay? He's posting on his page. Hey guys, take a look at this. This is pretty important. You know, all of those actions can equal donors and volunteers. They can be extremely important to your organization. So Freddie the fan is kind of like your foundation. They love your ideas, they wanna see your org win, and they have their own supporters. Okay, so very important with these four, and there are many more, but Wendy Ryder, Sharing Sam, Irene Influencer, and Freddie the Fan. These are the type of people that you can connect with. Okay, now before we go to two, I saw quite a few questions, and I am, let's see, what are a few items to concentrate on when updating your donor database? Very important, and I will I will definitely answer that in the end because it's related to. And let's see, how valuable is LinkedIn to be a part of? I'm going to tell you how valuable LinkedIn is just from the one feature that is free that I use on a regular basis. So it is very, very, at this point, I'm surprised it's even free still. I, that to be very honest with you. So I'll show you how valuable LinkedIn is. Uh, what is the LinkedIn function for nonprofits? And we'll talk about that. We have a potential large donor where we only have an address for them. How can we get a phone number? Now, this is an important question. It says we have a potential donor where we only have an address for them. How can we get a phone number for initial contact. They have been giving to our organization for many years. I look at this different window or window. I would actually want an email address versus their phone number. I have more success contacting donors via email. And it's a generational thing too, okay? Um, I'm a donor, of course, my son is. I would prefer a phone call sometimes. My son is a millennial and I guarantee you he wouldn't want a phone call. He just would not. He would love an email. It, it depends on that particular donor and how you can tell if your donor is active in social media, they may want an email versus a phone call. If they are not like zero presence, they have zero presence on, on social media then definitely they may want a phone call, okay? If this is a funder you're talking about, then, which I doubt it might be, 
then that's a whole different ball game. It's easier to find their information. But I would start with the email. There's free. If you type in Google free prospect research tools, there's too many to name. But if you type in Google and do that, then you can put their name in that or the organization and you can get the contact information. At least an email will be on there. It'll be pulled. So that's a great question. All right, so hang tight. Uh, Zoe and let's see and Wendell because Wendell had another question and I'll answer that at the end so let's talk about how to develop relationships with funders I see the other questions and I'll get to those a little later all right so now we're on collaborate okay these are all, these are all pieces to the puzzle so once you connect with your prospect, use your research to develop a relationship with a potential investor, board affiliation, university alumni, peer connection, media connection. It all makes sense to do that. And these are, hold on one second, I wanna go back with this. Now, board affiliation, I know it scares some nonprofit professionals because you know, your board is busy, you don't wanna approach them. I can tell you, it is one of the strongest connections you will find. And it may garner you the most success in your fundraising efforts, okay? University alumni is another strong one as well. Okay, living in Texas, this is the second thing that I look for. If they are alumni of one of the colleges in Texas, then more than likely someone on that board that the nonprofit I'm representing, that they have a connection. I almost guarantee it, okay? Very, very strong connections here. And that may be the case in your area. If you are in a area that's rural and you're kind of out from the city, look for peer connections, look for connections they may have on social networks. I push, social media research as part of your prospecting because it is a free tool number one and then linkedin has other things for nonprofits to use okay so it's, it's a great tool for you so questions to ask yourself when you're collaborating when you're doing this connection how do you engage prospects now okay if you, if you can answer that, put it in the chat if you wanna see if that's working for you or not. I can give you my opinion on it. How do you maintain relationships with current donors? Do you contact them once a month? Do you do a newsletter? Do you do any actions outside of the newsletter? Okay, because there's a few actions that you can do outside of it called the 20 by five method that will break down. How do you keep the momentum going? What, what's too much? That's where we're gonna talk about five actions you can do. And how do you handle lapsed donors? You have a handout, or you will probably after the presentation. That handout is lapsed donors checklist. This is a checklist that you can use to help you re-engage re -engage donors who have not given in a certain amount of time. Your organization may consider a lapsed donor one year. You may consider it three years, five years, 10 years, whatever you consider it. In fact, that's the first bullet point on that checklist. You have to define what that is for you. So these are good questions to ask yourself. And someone in the chat asked if the presentation will be available afterwards. They, are, they will send it to you afterwards, yes. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So we're gonna talk about the 20 by five donor connection matrix. This is very, very, very important because, and this came out of frustration actually. Being in the middle of my career, I was like, you know what? Do I contact them once a week? Do I do it once a month? Do I do phone call, email? Now we have social media. We, ha we have to have a presence on there. I felt like I was going crazy. <laughs> I just felt like I couldn't keep all the balls up in the air. So I needed something to get it straight in my mind as how to connect with donors and prospects, 
but not too much. And I didn't want to make an ask every single time. So I'm like, what do I do? So this is what I came up with. It's what I've been using for the last six, seven years. It's what I tell other people to use. And it's such success because number one, you're, you're setting your donor at the pace of your organization. Okay. When they see your email, they go from, oh gosh, you're emailing again to, oh, okay. They expect it. Okay. So this will help you with that. So 20 by five, 20% five actions. First one is a call to action. Include call to actions in 20% of your communications. This is the getting to the point part. You have to direct the reader to the reason for your contact. You don't want to do this in 100% of your communications. Now, the call to action, I'm not talking about at the end of your newsletter where you may put a link to your donate button or you may even have it in the middle. That is fine. You can have that as the template for all of your newsletters, absolutely. But that's not what I'm referring to. When I say call to action, if you have a current campaign that you're working on, okay, and that you have goals for, and you ask them to donate in your newsletter, that's a call to action. If you include a nonprofit story in your newsletter and you know you're telling them at the end, you know, you see the impact that we had with client A, can you help give to this cause? We would love your support. That's a call to action with a button at the end. That is a call to action, not directing them to your donate button. That's kind of standard. I'm talking about a direct ask is what you're doing for the call to action. Next one, upcoming events. If you have transitioned of virtual events as an organization, or you're like some of the organizations here where we're kind of getting back out there, um, there are a few galas scheduled at the end of the year, uh, believe it or not. So small, of course, and we're trying to get back out there a little bit. So if you have virtual or in-person events, inform them. In fact, you have the best excuse to inform them about it because you're letting them know, hey, we're having our first uh, you know, virtual gala, virtual event of the year. Um, we didn't do anything in 2020 you know, because we couldn't. So now we're getting back out there. That is your reason to contact them. The only way they're going to know is if you tell them. So this is very, very important. And I would even up this percentage a little bit because of the timing of it. You're letting them know that your in-person events are resuming. Now, if you're an organization where you all are not starting in-person events, say until next year, and so the only thing you're doing this year maybe is like virtual events or campaigns or something like that, still stay in communication. The last thing you want to do is have lapsed communication. Lapsed communication leads to lapsed donors. Okay, it all goes hand in hand. So definitely stay in communication. Next one is success and campaign results. You have to remind people of your success in the past and let them know what is in the future, what's coming up. If your organization um, vision has changed a bit, okay, if your goals and initiatives for 2021 have changed because your client needs have changed, okay, that's a great reason to inform the donor or the prospect of that. Very important. Donor partner love, with permission, of course. You want your volunteers, your sponsors, your social media ambassadors, that social media ambassadors are someone who repost and support your content on your behalf. You approach them just like volunteers. You want all of these people to feel appreciated, okay? They're your tree leaders. They're the backbone of your organization with your presence online. You want to remind them that they are not alone in supporting you. So if you are able to thank so-and-so with permission, 
then do that. Because as a donor myself, it's nice to see that other people are supporting your organization, that you have this, this um, volunteer program in place that, you know, it makes you feel better about what you're doing. And the last one is create client stories and testimonials on your posts, in your newsletter. It's so important. There is a nonprofit story handout that I have. And Bradley, I can send that one to you as well. Um, it's not part of this presentation because it's an entire hour and a half presentation itself about creating your nonprofit story from beginning to end. If you have one, you may be wondering the reason why you should even do another. More than likely, as an organization, you have brand new stories that need to be heard because of 2020. It is important for your donors and prospects to know what you were able to accomplish last year, going into this year, and how you still need their support. When you do that, when you craft and create a brand new nonprofit story, it gets attention because you're not telling the same old one. You know, people get used to seeing certain things and they scroll on by, okay? Or they may see it in your newsletter. When you let them know what you've accomplished and it's brand new to them, they see that you can pivot as an organization. I hate using that word so much, but it, it, just, it just fits. You know, we've all had to change maybe our fundraising efforts, but it shows who you are as an organization. So number three, how to recruit virtual volunteers using social media. And let's see where we're at. We're at 38, so we'll take questions at the end, 38 minutes after. Volunteer involvement. When you engage volunteers who were once donors, remember, you already have access to them. We're talking about getting volunteers. I drive home very, very much about volunteers being your best donors. Because if you go to Google and you put in the search box, volunteers, donors, statistics for nonprofits, you will see stats that will just blow you away. I'm telling you. It is, a, it is unreal, the connection between volunteers becoming donors and volunteers remaining donors because they want to support your organization. That's why I drive this home. If you are not able to have volunteers who can do a task in person, then there's always something that they can do online for you and that's repost, that's get your information out there. Okay, I even have um, know of volunteers who are helping with the marketing presence of nonprofits. They're volunteering their time because right now that's all that they can really contribute to and do. Those volunteers are donors. They become your fans. So show, show appreciation to them. You know, there are briefings that you can do with the same webinar platform you're using for meetings. You know, you can invite them that way. You can say thank you. You can remind them also of what's coming for the future of your organization. So when you engage volunteers who are new to your org, you can send an invite or do a call for volunteers. I have seen this on LinkedIn with great success. So the response you receive from that, it'll tell you either if they have no interest, or if they don't have the time to do it. If it is a time issue, you'll know. If it is no interest, then you have to move on, okay? And you might uh, contact them at a later date. So when I talk to prospects or donors, the number one reason they don't volunteer is they were never asked. They were never asked to volunteer. So it's something very important to include in your communications. If you need volunteers or if there's certain things that you can trust a volunteer to do for your organization, then I encourage it. It looks great in grant proposals that you have volunteers for your organization. It looks great on your presence 
in your presence online. Okay, something you can put on your website. It, it says a lot, it's a testament to who you are as a nonprofit. So this is the LinkedIn feature that I was talking about. LinkedIn for good, that is the link, but an easier way to get to the pages that you want is just put in Google LinkedIn nonprofits. It will bring up two options. Don't do it now, you can do it after the presentation, but it will bring up two options for you. If you're looking for board members or if you're looking for volunteers, I use this feature on a regular basis. You may wonder how LinkedIn is getting this information. When you sign up for LinkedIn, it asks you, would you like to be a volunteer or what are your interests? People who have checked those two, and it's not required for you to check, so it's not something that LinkedIn is pushing you to do. But when you check volunteer board members, it puts you in the category of nonprofit interests, okay? And when you look in LinkedIn, when you search for volunteers in your area, you can also drill down your search and choose people who are looking to become a board member or who are looking to volunteer to a local organization. This is an extremely important feature for you. And it's a feature that I have used over and over again. I have had success finding local volunteers using this LinkedIn feature. The board members is a little bit trickier because this is something really that you need to be careful about um, if you're a smaller nonprofit organization because people need to be vetted. You need, you, there's so many protocols in place. But the volunteer feature is a hidden gem that most people really do not know about. I don't work for LinkedIn. They're not giving me any money to say it. I wish they were, but it's just a feature that I absolutely love. It, it's a great feature. So I encourage you to try it. If you have any questions about it, put it in the chat because we'll answer them. I'll answer them shortly. So we're gonna talk about the, you, the four Ps of prospecting to gain interest in your initiatives, okay? This is one of my other methods of fundraising. I just come up with all of these things to help me in my fundraising efforts. I am the type of person, if you are a planner, if you are a person that likes a blueprint, that's why I use the 20 by five method. That's why I do the four Ps because it, it helps me streamline my efforts so I can get more done in other areas. So point, provide, proof and perspective. You wanna keep your message brief to the point and compelling when you are contacting a donor, when you're contacting a prospect, okay? Agitation is something that you can clearly hear in their voice. You want to keep it brief when you're talking with them or even emailing actually, okay? Because the thing that you have to concentrate most in your communication as far as emails is subject lines because it's the only thing getting them to open it. So the subject line is important to, um, to concentrate on with your emails. Provide, you wanna focus on providing information they want to know, not necessarily what you have to say, okay? So what do donors want to know? They want to know the reason for your email. Is this related to a campaign, okay? Is it, um, what are your current initiatives? What's the vision for the organization? What exactly do you need money for this year? Okay, what are you looking to accomplish? They want A, B, C, D, they want all of that answered right away. You also wanna generate social proof. Most of the slides that you have seen in this presentation have been about social proof. You wanna use LinkedIn to follow prospects or join groups related to your industry. I review grants on a federal, um, level and also for uh, local funders, organizations. And I can tell you as a grant reviewer for funders, the first thing that I go to when I'm reviewing an organization, if I don't know of them, I have no knowledge of them, I go to the internet, of course. I go to social media, see what they're posting, see if people are interested. I had a federal grant application ask for our Twitter handle 
times are changing when it comes to funders and donors and prospects. I was one of those, I did not want to embrace the part that social media has in my fundraising life, but it is a part of it. It is a part of it. And the last P is perspective. You wanna share company updates and campaign results. You are telling people how they should feel when you're telling them your nonprofit story and when you're sharing your, your company wins, okay? You want to, them to understand that you're still making traction no matter what's going on out in the world, that you're still serving your clients, that, that uh, your board members are happy, that your staff is on board and, and getting things done. You wanna share your company wins and your campaign results. So how to close, this is the last bullet that we'll talk about. So how to close using three steps for successful outcomes. Close is when you make your ask or you're talking with a funder, when you're connecting with someone that they want to buy into your organization, they want to support your organization. So we're gonna talk about how to close. This is your moment. This is what you have been waiting for. And this is where I used to buckle as a new, as a nonprofit professional newbie, a lot younger than I am now. And I was so scared. And it, you know, it's like, how do I end this conversation? How do I end this email? What do I do? This comes with practice and confidence. And I had to gain it over time. So I want to help you because these are the three things that I concentrate on. And when I follow these blueprints that I'm telling you, the four Ps, the 20 by five, what I teach other people, they use this over and over and over again to the point where practicing is not even something that they do. It's, they just fill in the blanks pretty much. So with your clothes, you wanna tell them about the milestones you've achieved. Everyone likes to be tied to a winner. OK, there is a reason why next time you're on social media, LinkedIn, say. The next time you see someone put something thought provoking on LinkedIn, um, something real interesting, you can actually watch their connection count go up. And I'll give you an example. I commented on something. I, I put a video, um, an inspirational video, something um, to inspire nonprofit newbies, something like that. My connection count was through the roof. When I put something or repost something that is a little bit bland and not as interesting, people don't buy into that. You want to let people know the milestones you've achieved because we all want to be connected to people who are winning, who we think are doing a great job. Okay. The time frame, there is an urgency with your campaigns, with what you're trying to do, okay? You want to let them, let them know that time frame. The future, everyone wants to be tied to what your vision is in the future. Let them know what they're connecting to, what they're, the collaboration that you're creating, okay? Let them know on your clothes what you're about four or five years from now. Now, I don't think you've received your handout yet, but this is the LAPS donor handout, okay? And so what you wanna do is prepare, engage, and follow up. We went over the 20 by five method. We went over all of these, these methods and everything. You wanna ask an invite, but remember, look at the first bullet point. You wanna define what it means to your organization, okay? I have my own thoughts. You have to go by what your organization defines lapsed donor as, okay? And the 20 by five, the donor connection matrix that we went over, that is available at funjoy.org if you click the purple bar, okay? So you can just have it as a one sheet for you. So you can have it at your desk or save it on your desktop so you know exactly what actions to do and when. And that is it. And let me go, hold on one second. My cursor is gone. Oh, there we go. Uh, let's see. Keep on that slide, how about that? All right, I am going to go to the questions. 
uh, let's see, I stopped at, I told Patricia, yes, the slides will be available after the presentation. All right. All right, great, Amy. I'm glad you heard the presentation. All right, Kathleen says, Candid candidates are advocates for your nonprofit. Great definition. The candidates that we went over with the little snazzy names and everything, that's exactly who, who they are. They are advocates for your nonprofit. I call them candidates because I promise you, you need to consider these people very well. You need to look at their background. If they're posting things on social media that don't line up with your organization, then by all means, go to the next person. Um, so this is very important. Remember, things live on social media forever, forever. So you want to make sure that you're vetting these people. So great, um, great definition, Kathleen. And let's see, Nels asks, our event announcements almost always include a call to action, a link to register, purchase tickets. How does this factor in your recommendation for 20% to call to action communication? Great question, Nels. What I would do is I would almost separate the 20 by five method from your event. And I'm gonna tell you why. With your events that you're doing, virtual or in person, that is a different communication path that you're taking, okay? So say you're like, there's a gala in October, okay, that I'm doing, gala in October. So I started communication for this gala in January, okay? All of the communications that I have for this gala is completely different and separate from regular communication that I have with donors. So the differentiation with the 20 by five method and event communications leading up to an event is that 20 by five is for regular donor communication. If you have a newsletter and the number one question I'm asked is how often? Twice a month, once a month, once a week is a little much, um, but if you can handle that, super. But if you're doing twice a month, once a month, or maybe every three weeks, something like that, you want it to be 20% of your call, your uh, communication. This is separate from your event announcements because that is a schedule of announcements that you have leading up to an event and you need to keep reminding them to register, okay? It takes seven to 10 times. I know you marketing professionals know this. Um, for somebody to even, for it to click for them to understand to register because we're bombarded with so much information. So yeah, that's a separate communication. Great question. Uh, let's see. Zoe asked, regarding donor shout out on newsletters, how do we decide who to feature and make sure donors don't feel that they are left out? In my opinion, this is Zoe's opinion, in my opinion, the dollar amount given is a good start but shouldn't be the sole reason Dollar amount should be one reason that I would consider. The other reason I would consider, Zoe, is their commitment. If they've been a donor who is consistently given to your organization, where they're almost holding a record, it's been 10 years that they've been giving, or five years, and you, of course, have their um, permission to do so, then absolutely I would shout them out. I don't think there's even a question that I've ran across as far as donors feeling left out, because there are so many times that you can do this. You know, you're not gonna do it one time and it's over with. And what you can also do, Zoe, it doesn't need to be just one donor shout out. You can shout out several if you would like. I've seen multiple, okay? You can do that and you can take that same post and put it on your website, social media, everywhere, in your newsletters as well with a link to it. So absolutely, you can do several donors at one time and I've done that. Great question. Uh, let's see. Don, hey Don, in communicating success, how, is it important to show personal impact as well as numeric changes or policy impacts? It's very important. 
personal impact is important because this is where your nonprofit stories come in. Numeric changes are your stats. Remember the audiences that you're speaking to. Some people are driven by numbers. And I will say that when I receive donor communication and they have, we've reached our goal or we're this far from our goal and they include that in the subject line, I usually open that email. I usually open it. Numbers uh, propel people to act. But you also have people who are not driven by those numbers and they like stories. They like to hear the impact that your clients are having. Okay, both of these can be on your 20 by five method. I would use both of them interchangeably. If you have a certain campaign, you can use them together. Okay, in your donor communication. If you're trying to engage prospects, both are needed because as a prospect, I need to know your stats, that you're, you're doing well. And then I also need to see and hear the impact from you that you're having on your clients. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Great question, Don. And let's see, Courtney, she says the LinkedIn is not working. Put in Google LinkedIn, uh, excuse me, LinkedIn nonprofit interests, and it will take you to, to their community page because it's just for nonprofit organizations. All right, Steve says, what do you think about wealth screening services? This is what I used in the beginning of my career. Um, I used three actually, wealth screen services. They were worth their money back then. And I'll tell you why, because I didn't have any contacts. I didn't have any contacts starting out, didn't really know anybody in the industry. I don't use that wealth screening services and I don't know a nonprofit that does actually two, two who are extremely large, two extremely large nonprofit organizations here in Houston use wealth screening services. But all of the other ones that I work, they don't need that. It, it's not really needed now just because of this component of social media. Everybody tweets what they're doing. Everybody, somebody is involved with something. And also people who are on wealth screening services, they usually may belong to certain associations. Okay, associations is another in that you can have in finding viable prospects who can be converted to donors. So I think starting out in your prospect journey, Steve, I think wealth screening services can benefit you, but you will find that once you use it, you will find other ways with your network, with your peers. Um, there's a great organization or several. Um, one that I am a part of is Grant Professionals Association. And I know some of you may be familiar with it, but even though Grant is in the title, I mean, these are fundraisers. AFP is another one, of course, Association of Fundraising Professionals. Once I built up my network, I didn't need a wealth screening service. So that that's something that you can consider. So definitely at first, if you want to check it out and see what it's about, absolutely. And let's see, the last question I have, I believe I'll make sure that I've hit them all. Oh no, there's 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 a few more since I was talking. All right, so do we want, Anita, hi Anita, do we want to follow back the individuals who follow us on social? Anita, I can answer this in one sentence. If their background, experience, and their presence on social media is not controversial, is professional, and will represent your organization in a good way, then you can. If it does not, do not. Absolutely do not. I think people forget, and I see this on social media all, all the time, almost every action you have on social media, your friends list sees that action. They can see almost every action when you like something, uh, when you're uh, going to an event. As an organization, if you're liking, sharing, um, commenting those comments, it will say XYZ organization commented on uh, Sally's post. It lets your friends let us know everything you're doing. So yeah, you have to vet 
people like that and, and make sure. The LinkedIn tools is called Nonprofit Interest, and it'll show you the community page on there for you. Uh, let's see. Bradley, is it okay if I answer these last six or so? I know we're over time. I'm, I'm absolutely fine with that. If you're okay with that, I would love for you to do that. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I um, allot it for it. All right. So I'm at Don. I'm not sure if this is the same Don or not. Let's see. How much do in-person connections help? And how can you best connect with people who don't want to talk on the phone or meet in person? Two, two ways you can connect. The first one's basic, but I'm going to tell you to, both of them. Email, compelling emails. Okay, that could be a whole webinar on, on its own, I swear. And one thing you want to look at is Kindful and, and Bluminars, their, their catalog of webinars. You want to, to look at that and really, um, you know, like review them, make notes. Those are great webinars, fantastic. So please, please, please do that. Um, but email is the first. The second one is when you are doing organizational updates or if you're going to start, do it via a webinar platform, whatever that may be. Keep that recording and put that organizational update on your website, send it to them so they can see what you're about. People will look at a video sometimes versus even reading an email because, because you can look at a video on the go, okay? So definitely do that. Do the email or you can do a video via any webinar platform. One nonprofit I worked with, they wanted to start a podcast and didn't have time to do so. I took all their Zoom recordings, put it on their website, called it a podcast, and then they um, got volunteers that way. Those volunteers will become donors because they had time to listen to the Zoom uh, recording audio versus you know, looking at an email. They probably wouldn't have gained them any other way. So, I mean, you can take your recordings with these webinars, your organizational updates, you speaking into the camera or doing an audio and repurpose that and use it to your advantage. Oh, thank you, Crystal, for your time. You're welcome, Wendell, absolutely. Thank you so much for the kind words. Tammy asks, do you have recommendations for the best way to reconnect with LAPS donors? Hey, we miss you. <laughs> Good question, Tammy. Use your checklist that you will receive, okay? The, the checklist, the LAPS donors checklist, you want to use that, but go in the order that it is. So first start with your definition, okay? Define LAPS donors for your organization. People always want me to give them a suggestion. I say if you haven't given in two years, you're, it's a LAPS donor, okay? I have organizations who prefer five years. Whatever that org goes by is what I go by, okay? So you have to figure out what, look at your database, segment it, Okay, and there are webinars on segmenting your donor database. You want to segment it, and then you want to figure out who has not given in the time frame that you choose. So, absolutely. Great question. Denise asks, How many times a week do you suggest we post on social media? It's not the times per week, it's you repurposing the content you have. So, for instance, um, I'll do all social media planning at the end of the month. <clears throat> for the next month, excuse me, for the next month, I will take 10 to 12 posts, okay? I'll post them sporadically every few days, schedule them. I'll take those same 10 to 12 posts, make blog posts out of them, then repurpose them again and do an audio recording if it's uh, two or three that I can put together and put that on the nonprofit organization's website. And then those same 10 to 12 posts, you want to post several times throughout the month because social media is a running timeline. We are scrolling so fast and absorbing so much information. You wanna take that same post and keep posting. So it's not 30 days of posts, it's 10 to 12 that you keep repurposing over and over again. That's how you get um, the message across in a person's mind. 
okay? We're habitual people, so we're used to, we want to see it over and over. That's how people register for events. They've seen it seven to 10 times over and over again. And then when you get closer to the day, oh, I need to register before I miss out. It's the same mentality. All right, let's see. Do you need permission to use emails for fundraising? I have read both yes and no. If you're asking if you need permissions to permission to mention an individual donor, then you may for your organization. I always get permission. If this is a funder giving you something, then no, I have not I have not uh, went after permission. But what I can tell you, Merrily, uh, Merrily, that's her name. You want to do what is what your organization requires. Okay, I've worked for different nonprofits and they all have their different policies. Okay, so you want to do what your organization requires, absolutely. If you are featuring a donor in your email, then you want to get permission. Yeah, I, I would imagine so, yes, I would. All right, thanks Catherine for the kudos. And we have three questions left, Bradley, so I'm getting there. <laughs> Okay. Hey, okay, no worries. I'm, I, these are great, great um, pieces of information. So I'd love for you to continue if you have time. Oh, oh absolutely. All right. So hello, Jennifer. Um, any tips? Jennifer asks, any tips for first conversations with potential major donors? Whew, we have had multiple high, work net, high net worth individuals have their assistants reaching out Oh my gosh, how do you transition into that ask? That is a great question. There is a fundraising, uh, I teach a class called Fundraising Scripts and not trying to do a plug or anything like that, but there is a method that I use. I create all these methods because it's less work for me once I have the method written down. So my Fundraising Scripts class, we go over four components that your script needs. Your script is your ask, okay? So those four components, I can actually, uh, Bradley, I'll send them to you. Is, is that okay? Absolutely, yeah, that'd be great. Okay, I'll send them to you or Stephen or Courtney. I'll send them to someone. But there are four questions and they have context. So Jennifer, you will receive that, I'm speaking, hoping this is going to happen, but you'll probably receive that with your um, your handout and probably your presentation. But there are four questions. But the questions center around four components. The first one sends around, centers around you introducing yourself and quickly, and I mean quickly telling them why, the reason for the phone call or the email. The second one is what your organization is doing to combat, to fulfill your mission, to combat the issue. How are you fulfilling the cause? The third question is the one that most people don't think about. It's a great component and it's how you fill the gap. How are you filling the gap in your region, in the, in the nation? Uh, if you're an international nonprofit, how are you filling that gap? And the last one is when you make the ask. Okay, so those are the four, and I will send those to uh, one of the kind, kindful people, absolutely, so you can have them. I went pretty quickly, but yeah, I'll send them to you, Jennifer, but those are your four. Uh, thanks, James, for the kudos. Appreciate it. And let's see, this has been one of the best fundraising, aw, uh, best fundraising webinars she ever joined. Thank you, Abby. I, I so appreciate it. I love what I do in sharing info. And Amy says, this webinar has been terrific. Thank you so much, Amy, appreciate it. And Abby says, any advice for reaching out to foundations we prospected, but currently don't have a relationship with? If you prospected them and they're on your email list, okay, then you want to definitely use your 20 by five method, okay? This keeps you from being frustrated of how do I reach out to them? What do I say? What do I do? Use the 20 by five method. When you are trying to cultivate relations with them, relationship with them, 
you want to use the 4P method, okay, that we discuss. That's why it's important when you get this presentation, break it down and make it work for you, okay? So you're building your relationship. The first thing you need to do is follow them on social media. Follow them on social media and see what they're talking about. See any updates they have. See who's on their board. See who's connected with them. Pull their uh, the financials and see who they've given to in the past. That is one of the very first things I do. Okay, absolutely. It, it makes a difference. And let's see, before I get to Jennifer's, I want to make sure I got everyone. All right. So Janelle. Oh, it's Janelle. Saying thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thanks, Tammy. I appreciate it. And I think those are all the questions, Bradley. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Crystal. I, I know I'll just say real quick, I know we're a little over on time and people probably need to jump off, but I'll just say, I, I think you gave such amazing, um, just practical advice, like um, the Google alerts. I, you know, I've, I've sat through so many of these webinars, um, you know, with people giving different types of advice, but that's one I've never heard. I use them a lot for myself, but I didn't think about using them for, uh, you know, uh, fundraising. And so I think that's, uh, just fantastic advice. And then I was not at all aware about the LinkedIn features. I think these things are just amazing tools and such so uh, kind of you to share kind of some of those ideas. So thank you so much. Courtney, we'll follow up with you to get all those different resources and we'll make sure we get them in the email for everyone. But uh, thanks for your time today, Crystal. Oh, you're very, very welcome. And Bradley mentioned a good point. Be careful with the Google alerts. Make sure your keywords are detailed. So yes. thank you so much, Bradley. This was a lot of fun. I always love uh, presenting with uh, Bloomerang and meeting you and Courtney. And so um, this is wonderful. So thank you so much. Hope you all learned a lot. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, everyone. Happy fundraising. Have a great rest of your Thursday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.